Okay, and now for the last talk in the uh, morning session, Joey Hess will talk about Debian cosmology. Well, thanks. Um, good morning, everybody. I hope you had a good night's sleep. I uh, enjoyed sleeping out in the tent in the middle of Switzerland, looking out over the lake. And uh, this is kind of the first DebCon where I've kind of had a problem. If I just look over there, I probably just you know, lose focus for a minute. <laughs> it's so gorgeous. Um, I thought this would be a good, a good place to, uh, you know, get up on a mountaintop, as it were, and think about the bigger picture and, uh, you know, try to think about, you know, some of the big questions, the big vague things that we wonder about but don't really sometimes talk about maybe in public in front of a live streaming audience. I don't know. Um, so I have this crazy Debian cosmology idea. And uh, let's look at Debian, you know, let's look at the universal operating system and, uh, you know, think about, you know, thinking back 20 years back to when Debian was founded up to the present and where it's going to go from here. So um, back in the beginning, there was kind of this void, <laughs> you know, and there was a, there was a gap. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> and uh, Ian Murdoch saw this and he said, well, you know, let's make a new Linux distribution to replace SLS. It'll be great. I'll get it done in a couple of weeks, you know. <laughs> and this was back in 1993. And, uh, you know, th just, just as with the Big Bang, you have the laws of nature somehow forming out of the void. We developed these standard principles of Debian that have pretty much stood the test of time, although some of them, like the one package, one maintainer thing, have changed over time. But, you know, we kind of, we, you know, this is all the stuff that we think of as the core principles of Debian today, probably. Um, you know, and this was kind of in the period of 94 to 98. Um, you know, this early period where there weren't very many people involved in Debian and things got done fairly quickly. Um, I have down here the, uh, one of the initial threads for the Debian Constitution. Um, this is where um, Ian Jackson said, you know, I think we'll use this Constitution proposal as to bootstrap the Constitution. So we'll vote on the Constitution using the principles of the Constitution. That could be a kind of controversial thing to say, actually, because, you know, it's, it's a bootstrapping problem. Um, but, you know, the threat actually wasn't that long, by, I would say, by today's standards, for something that important, right? So, um, you know, this was, as I said, the early period. And uh, then, in the late 90s and early 2000s, we went through this inflation period, just like the universe blew up, got bigger and bigger. You know, we have the nice up and to the right graph, which is the uh, number of uh, maintainers over time. And, uh, you know, I don't think that this data is very good, but I'm kind of happy to see that it started going up again in the most recent election, although that's probably also just because Zach wasn't running. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, during this inflation period, we had things happen like adding ports to Debian. One port in 98, two ports in 99, two ports in 2000. That's two ports a year. You know, it's, it's a crazy rate of change. Um, and then we had all these derivatives started popping up. We'd had Debian for hams for a while. But, you know, we got these derivatives that you don't think of much anymore, like Corel Linux, Stormix, Progeny. These are, these are names that we haven't mentioned in a while. But uh, they were the early, you know, corporate entities saying, well, we're going to try to do something here with Debian and modify it. And, of course, more, many more came from there. And um, another big event in this period was that apt started out. And uh, this is one of the early threads about apt. Um, this is about a year after it started being developed. Everybody started trying it and realized, oh, it actually doesn't work on my system because I have these packages that are half configured. I have a few broken dependencies because I just forced something at some point. And everybody tried apt and they're like, gosh, it, it says my system's inconsistent and it doesn't have apt get dash uh, f in yet. So it doesn't work. And uh, so I thought this was an amusing thread. It's also not really too long a thread, but uh, you know, here's, a, here's an introductory or a representative message. I don't know if you can read it back there. But, you know, it's just what I said. AppGet doesn't seem to work. It says my system lacks integrity. And then Jason Gunthorpe, who wrote App, said, well, you know, I don't think I've actually seen a Debian system that, that, is, that has a perfect dependency set up so that App can actually work on it. 
And, um, you know, if you think about introducing some big new change like Apt, it doesn't work at all. Um, and this was in April of 1998. If we then move forward one month to May of 1998, here's somebody saying, this makes me wonder if we should think about dropping this auto-up script that we're using for upgrades, some kind of a shell script or something, and switch to apt. Um, auto-up seems to work, and maybe we shouldn't postpone Debian 2.0 for apt, but auto-up's a hack, and apt is what you do an entire um, bow to ham upgrade in deselect. Wow. Um, I was kind of surprised to see this. It turns out I wrote that. I had no idea that I proposed <laughs> converting Debian to app for 2.0. It, uh, it didn't actually happen in May of 1998. We had to wait a whole year until March of 99 when 2.1 came out. And this is a quote from Debian history about apt, which I thought was a great quote. It established a new paradigm for package acquisition and installation. Um, and it really did, you know. Um, if you look now at things that or basically command line compatible with apt, or more or less command line compatible. Maybe they, they didn't quite understand the difference between upgrade and update. There's so many of them. It, it's crazy. Um, and one of the interesting things about this list is if you look at and see which ones of these actually do it securely, it's a really small subset. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, you know, I, maybe some of them use HTTPS in some way and have a little bit of security there. I don't know. I didn't check them all in detail, but uh, of course back then app didn't have any security either. It was just pulling stuff via HTTP off the web and hey, it'd be the right thing because why wouldn't it be? Um, so, you know, soon after app came out, this is a screenshot from 2002, but it was around earlier. We, st we got appget.org, which uh, was all these third-party app repositories. And uh, this was kind of interesting. There were hundreds of different repositories you could go off, add your sources.list, get your packages. And we kind of started thinking, wow, maybe we're going to change how Debian works in some way. Maybe we'll have some kind of a central core and, you know, everything else will just be pulling from other repositories somewhere. And we kind of went off on a divergent path. We kind of went down a wormhole to some kind of a distributed apt or app store model where you know, there's Debian and there's all the stuff that you pull in from here and there, and if somebody wants to make a package, they do. And this kind of is what happened today, too. You can pull, you know, signed packages from Google and from, you know, Debian Multimedia or Deb Multimedia and that kind of thing. But we didn't really go down that path. We're still very much a centralized distribution. I kind of think it's interesting to think about what could have happened if we'd branched off a different way there. But, you know, there were good reasons to keep it centralized, such as security. And if you now fast forward to the present, um, here's appget.org from 2011. It's been broken. We can't check if these repositories work anymore. We're not accepting new submissions. And this is what happened to Debian Multimedia.org, which is a pity, but, you know, it's a, a Russian domain about motorcycles or something. I don't know. Uh, so, <coughs> so that's kind of the inflation period of Debian. Um, and then we can move forward again into the modern era. And uh, this might be where my cosmology analogy gets a little bit strained, but we'll see. <laughs> um, so I think you can see two, you can, I've picked out two things about the modern era of Debian, you know, this past 10 years or 15 years. Um, so one of them, just as in the universe, you have large scale structures, you know, forming, you know, galaxies and larger, larger structures. Um, in Debian, we've kind of developed all kinds of structures on top of the one maintainer, one package model, and extending it and going beyond it. Um, so a few of these, you know, it's the teams. Lucas showed us, you know, the graph of team maintenance increasing over the past 10 years or so. Um, and, you know, we've, we've just developed all these structures. You know, custom Debian distributions, um, you know, stuff like VI, different projects within Debian. And so it gets pretty complicated. It's not a, it's not a, homo it's not a uh, heterogeneous thing, it's, or a homogeneous thing. It's all clumped around in different places. And we all, if you also look at where are people using Debian, that's differentiated a lot, too. It's not just we are the universal operating system, we say, but a lot of people are using Debian on servers, and a few are on laptops, and basically nobody is on a mobile phone except for a few people who are lucky enough to still have an open loco or something like that, right? So... You know, we've really differentiated Debian a lot. Uh, 
So that's uh, the large scale structure thing. I think it's, it's interesting to think about it because you know, it, it kind of makes you think about how Debian's evolving. Um, now this is where it really gets strained. Um, Redshift, okay. Um, <laughs> how do we have Redshift in Debian? I don't see any red when I look out unless I've been in the middle of a flame war or something. Um, here's a kind of an amusing paper, which I don't think has been peer reviewed yet, but uh, it says, well, what if the universe, rather than actually expanding right now, like we think it is because of Redshift, what if the mass of everything is increasing at once? And it says, well, we would, everything would work pretty much just like it does now. We wouldn't even be able to test this theory. Um, and while, you know, I don't know if the universe, uh, the mass of the universe is increasing exponentially over time like this paper says it is, it seems a little unlikely. Um, Debian's mass is definitely, has definitely increased. We have an enormous mass and an enormous momentum. We're moving in a certain direction and it's really hard to move Debian into a different direction now. So, you know, one really easy example of this, System D. You know, think about how many threads we've had about system D lately, <laughs> and yeah. And this is just, this isn't replacing dpackage with apt and breaking all of our dependencies and having to change everything. This is changing how systems boot, which you do once a week or once a month or once a year or whatever. It's, it's a minor change as things go, right? And yet it's, it's an enormous controversy inside the project. So I think we have to think about you know, this momentum, this mass, and how do we manage it? How can we make Debian nimble on top of all this, you know, momentum? So I think that's probably the largest problem that Debian is facing right now and will face in, you know, the next however far out you want to look. Um, it's, it's kind of uh, hard to give a talk about Debian cosmology because when, what is a long time period, long time scale in Debian? We have 20 years of uh, history to look back on. Can we, you know, can people think in their head, wow, will Debian be around in 20 years? I don't know. You pick a time scale that, you know, that seems to make sense to you for the rest of this talk. I'm not gonna try to force some kind of a time scale on you. If you wanna think 100 years ahead, great. If you wanna think 10 years ahead, okay, you know. Um, but I'm gonna try to think about uh, moving forward um, but first, I have a little digression, which I forgot about. Um, so, one of the examples of a way that the, uh, you know, the momentum in Debian can be a problem. I, I mentioned apt. Well, there's this interesting thing being developed right now called functional package management. Um, it started out with NixOS, and now the GNU project's gotten involved with it with this GNUIC, GUIX? I don't know how to say it. Um, the idea is that it somehow takes ideas from functional programming and applies them to package management. So I, it's bread and butter for me. I'm really interested in it being a Haskell guy now, you know, being in a functional program. I'm like, wow, there's some interesting ways to use these ideas. It's not really functional, but it's a neat terminology to hook on it. And uh, what this lets you do is it's kind of a source-based system in a way, I don't know. Has anybody used any of these systems in the audience? I'm just curious. You have, Zach, okay. I'd love to chat with you about it and get a broader idea, but you know, the, the idea is kind of that you never make a destructive change to the system. Every package change is atomic, and if you have dependencies, you might have multiple versions of a package installed at a time, and it's completely different than the dpackage model in every way. And you know, it's kind of inconceivable to think that Debian would switch to something like this model now. It would just be so incredibly hard you know, the switching the app would be just nothing in comparison, and it's, our, it's much later in our evolution, and we have a lot more structure built up around our current system than we did back then even. But, uh, you know, it, this is an example of something that, you know, the universe is coming up with neat new things. How do we possibly put them into Debian? We can obviously package up these package managers and make it easy enough for people to use them as a third party thing. You can install stuff in your home directory with functional package management and just, you know, have a system on top of Debian and that kind of thing. But how do you, how do you integrate this kind of thing or ideas from this kind of thing into Debian? I think the closest we're coming is the switch to more uh, declarative systems for Debian packages so that rather than maintainer scripts, we have triggers and stuff like that. But this is just taking it to a whole new level. 
and you know there's a lot to learn from stuff like this. So that's my kind of quick look at the modern era of Debian. Let's move into the futures that I was talking about. So just like in cosmology, I think uh, you all probably know where this is going to go. Um, you know, one of the models for the future is that Debian is in some way going to continue to expand and grow for however long you want to think ahead. Um, and there's kind of two ways that I think this can happen. Um, it, could, it could be a targeted growth where we pick a direction we want Debian to move in, and we just put everything behind that, and we have enough momentum going that we can continue to maintain growth as time goes on and meet the needs of you know, that one area. So we could pick, say, the server market and say, okay, we're doing all this Debian cloud stuff. People talked about all the talks that are gonna be here at DevConf about that. You know, if you, there's a lot of that going on. We have, if you go out to any virtual VPS provider, you know, you can pick a Debian image pretty much on every single one of them. You, you know, it's, it's big in that area, obviously. Um, or we could say, well, we're gonna try to, you know, also handle desktop or mobile or something. Pick, a, pick something a little bit more targeted might be a good idea than just something that broad. But, you know, maybe if we decide, well, we just wanna do this and this, then that would help us grow. I don't know, it's just one model. Um, if you look at mobile though, and you look at where Debian is right now, this is a screenshot of uh, Little Debbie, which is a Android app that it basically de bootstraps Debian. That's what it's doing there in the screenshot. And this is kind of the current state of the art of Debian on all the mobile devices that every single person out there has in their pocket, I'm assuming, that aren't running Debian probably. Uh, you know, it's pretty basic. It really doesn't give you a system that can do a lot of wonderful things unless you're wanting to do wonderful things at the command line in a, you know, with a virtual keyboard, which isn't much fun. Um, you know, what can we, you know, you could think about what can we do to expand this? You know, can we say, add Android support into Debian in some way so you can install Android apps and run them? You know, can we have some way of getting a, you know, installing something in a ch root of this type and then displaying it on the normal Android you know, display and having a full interactive application and that kind of thing. Um, so that's kind of an example of how we could go into one area and try to expand, you know, get, get Debian growing in that area. Um, the other, you know, the other major way that I think we could grow Debian or that Debian could continue growing is this more com community-driven model. Um, this is kind of where you have different projects doing their own thing and Debian can somehow come in and help them out. And you know, these are kind of, you know, we have some good examples like Freedom Box, did I spell the right? And Tails and stuff like that, um, that are, you know, using Debian in great ways. They're doing wonderful stuff. Hopefully they're getting a lot of developers, I hope. <laughs> I don't know if that's the case. Um, but you know, they're community driven things. They're ways that Debian can expand out into an area without having to move the whole project there. You can just say, it's a custom Debian distribution. It's a blend, whatever and we're still, you know, it's still contributing back. It's a wonderful, you know, ecosystem going on there. Um, now, if you look at something like the Raspberry Pi, I think um, we kind of made a mistake with the Raspberry Pi because we said we're not gonna support the uh, specific ARM um, instruction set that they want to use because it's 5% faster or something. Um, and so they went off and built Raspbian, and that's fine. Um, you know, but we've kind of, I think, possibly lost a little bit of the mind share in the Raspberry Pi community because everybody is like, well, okay, we've got this Raspbian thing. It's not Debian, right? Of course it is in pretty much every important way. Um, and maybe if we had been a little bit more open to this project coming in and saying, we would like to build everything for ARM v5, whatever it was, you know, maybe we would have had a bit more opportunity for growth and expansion there. And then if, if you look at just Debian developer communities in general, um, you know, there's always opportunities which we sometimes don't take advantage of to have really good relationships with, you know, various interesting projects that might end up using Debian in some way or might end up contributing back or becoming part of it even. And so I think that, um, you know, I really feel pretty bullish about this community-driven thing. I think it's kind of how Debian has always worked. Um, I don't know if you know, it's, it's hard to look out and say, oh, in 10 years, Debian will be an attractive target for people doing, you know, whatever 
the equivalent of the Raspberry Pi is in 10 years, but I hope so. Um, so that's the one model. Whoa, what happened to the other model? Ah, okay, so steady state. You know, it's, the, it's another cosmological model, obviously. Um, I think, you know, we could just continue sort of coasting along indefinitely without really saying, oh, we're gonna make big changes, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. We can just keep doing our thing and be completely happy for, you know, as long as you want to look out. We've got a lot of momentum, we can keep going. Even if we all stop doing much today, I think Debbie would keep going for years and years, quite happily. Um, and, you know, after a while, you start having to think about generational things. Um, you know, I think mo when most of our generation or generations got involved with Debian, we kind of had some infrastructure that we just kind of thought was there. Maybe it was a kernel or a C compiler or something like that. We didn't really think about it. Maybe we occasionally ran into a bug in it and we reported the bug, but it wasn't something that was, you know, at the forefront of our minds as something new and exciting, necessarily. And maybe that's where Debian's going. Maybe Debian becomes an infrastructure that things get built on top of over time. And, you know, De there's enough people to keep it going because you know, if nothing else, people like Go companies like Google, as long as they continue using Debian, are going to want to employ tons of Debian developers just to keep it going. So, you know, this is definitely, I think, a likely possible future at some point is that Debian becomes an infrastructure, and that's fine. And you know, if you continue looking forward, does it continue being infrastructure at some point? Does it get replaced? or does it even matter if it gets replaced in X years? I don't know. Um, but, you know, I, th I think this is another likely possibility. I uh, will see. And then, of course, we have this final fun possibility that you get. And uh, I, might, I would probably put some bullet points up here, but I've, uh, I, I had an unexpected root canal and stuff, so I kind of ran out of slides at this point. But, uh, <laughs> um, you know, you can have a big crunch. And this is always my favorite possibility for the universe as a whole. I don't know about for Debian. <laughs> um, you know, what, what would happen if Debian just petered out and somehow died and fell off a cliff and everything started going down and everybody switched to Android on their servers or who knows what? I mean, what are they gonna replace us with? I can't possibly think, but maybe, there's gotta be something out there, right? Maybe it's all Fedora in the future, I don't know. Um, hi, Fedora folks. <laughs> um, you know, this is definitely a possibility that we have to keep in mind, and it's not like the end of the world, right? It's only the end, it would only be the end of Debian, and even if that happened, think back to that earlier slide about app establishing a new paradigm in package management. Um, you know, even if Debian stopped being actively used and developed at some far future point that I don't want to imagine, it would still have influenced things in a great many ways, and I think we could all be quite pleased with the work that we had done on it. Um, of course, we all hope that it will continue to be used for as long as we're involved in the project, or maybe 10 years longer so we can keep using Debian systems after we retire. <laughs> um, so I kind of thought that I would, you know, take a little poll of the audience. Um, who's, who thinks that we're gonna somehow continue to expand for however long you want to imagine as a long time? Hands, continued expansion. I would say maybe 10% of the room. Okay, so who's for steady state? Slightly fewer than for expansion. Okay, big crunchers. <laughs> okay, well, I think we're for expansion. <laughs> what was that? So, um, so that's really all that I came here to say. It, it's a fairly fluff talk, I know. I hope that you've enjoyed it. Um, maybe some people have some other cosmological models that they'd like to, for, like to r suggest. I have a question for my audience. Yeah. Andrew uh, Cater, uh, at, sort of relevant to the uh, big crunch scenario, Andrew asks, a AMA Cater on IRCS, I'm watching other community distributions fragment and lose focus. Fedora, OpenSUSE, SUSE, are killing themselves right now. Uh, are we doing the same? Hmm. 
I don't think that we're fragmenting as such. We've already kind of fragmented already. Um, there was the whole Ubuntu thing, which I think is the first time I've said that word in this talk. Um, you know, and we, uh, I don't know if we lose focus as such. We've never really had focus, have we? We've all just done our own thing and it's happened, you know? <laughs> I was just saying to somebody over here that, that one of the differences is that um, those distros are actually uh, more tightly tied to something else that mm -hmm. matters. Uh, whether it's the commercial distribution organization that they were sort of spawned out of or, or, or whatever, that they've had a, 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 uh, a less completely community-driven uh, reason to exist and to continue to exist than Debian has. So I would not be surprised if we don't end up having an entirely different life cycle than something like Fedora, OpenSUSE. Um, the question I was going to pose, um, I've noticed, as you have, and you made a couple of sort of references to this, that the average length of thread about uh, almost anything has gotten a lot larger. One of the things that I observed a while back, though, is that the average number of participants per thread had not actually increased all that much. It was certainly, for any given thread, a much smaller percentage of the people currently active in the project than used to be the case when there were 30 of us and five of us were screaming at each other. So. I'm wondering if there's, I don't know exactly what to take from that, but the notion that you know a similar number of people can just scream at each other for a whole lot longer and still not come to a conclusion, um, I don't know if there's anything to, to take from that or learn from it or not. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I was gonna, I had actually meant to say that um, I was going to put the systemd thread on here, but um, despite this being pretty, a pretty zoomy thing, there are, resolution, there are limits to floating point resolution and eventually you can't actually represent the whole thread on, uh, in Ice Weasel or whatever I'm running here. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, maybe what's happened is that we have either A, we just have more people and so the, the number of people who feel really strongly about something, they feel much more strongly about it. You have a small subset who all feel that they have to win. And so they just keep talking about this and they don't come to a consensus. Do you have a thought? Yeah, it's, it's really interesting because um, as a project, I think we have this um, sense about ourselves that we're all about freedom and so forth. And somewhere along the way, freedom got translated into we should all be able to have our own way. And that, has, that was really not part of the freedom that we cared about when this project was young. Um, even when there were strong debates, they were debates about you know, technical details or you know, when the Constitution was being drafted, there were, there were a few sort of big questions about how should this be structured. And then you know, a draft got generated, a lot of folks looked at it and went, yeah, that's yeah. close enough and off we ran. And the, the amount of bike shedding that goes on these days just scares me a little bit because it seems like taking that word freedom and translating it way too much into not needing to collaborate or not needing to come to agreement and consensus. Now, I don't know how we change that or fix it, but um, it bothers me sometimes when I see people take the things that I thought of when I first joined the project in 1994 as being fundamental tenets of the project, and they use the same words, but they mean something very different, and it causes their behaviors to be very different from what I would like to see. Yeah, um, you know, when, I, when the Constitution was originally proposed, I was kind of against it, and I thought, well, this seems like a lot of faff around for something that shouldn't matter, and I, I didn't even bother to vote on it, and, uh, you know, because I was like, well, if, if Ian wants to do this, great. Ian could do this. You know, he'll take care of it. If it breaks, he'll fix it. And, you know, I think we've kind of, there's, maybe it's just that we have a lot of people now who Debian is an important part of their life, maybe professionally or, you know, personally much more important. How many people here in the room have their livelihood in some way connected to Debian? So probably about as many people as want Debian to continue growing, which... <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. Uh, one thing I just wanted to add to what Vito was saying about the uh, bike shedding and stuff. Um, in, prepare, in preparation for my boff later this week about the uh, uh, code of conduct, I've actually been reading a lot of other codes, codes of conduct uh, on a page prepared by SAC. Thanks for that. Um, and one 
item that I saw coming back a few times and which I've also taken into my proposed code of conduct that we'll be discussing is about um, be col uh, collaborative, try to work with all the people. Um, and I think that's, that's, it could help to, to put something like that there. Um, but it's just a proposal anyway. We yeah. still have to discuss it. Yeah. So, um, let let me as a um, as a um, dark and destructive person um, focus on the uh, on the big crunch model for um, for a moment. Um, the question is, um, what would what would happen? What would we be able to um, to do in Debian if we um, would be in this big crunch situation? Right. Um, because, okay, now we are big. We we are very important, and we are central to the um, quite central to the free, um, free software um, world in in a number of um, ways. So, what happens if um, this world in some ways disintegrates? We um, obviously there must be a replacement. So, um, we should be open um, to change and um, revolve in a in a way that um, makes. Um, the world go on, even if we, in, in the way we are now, fundamentally change. You know, I, I haven't, I didn't really think about the big crunches affecting the free software community as a whole. I kind of just assumed that that was some background noise that kept everything going, even if Debian went away. Um, I mean, yeah, it, it seems to me that Debian could definitely go away without the free software community fragmenting or imploding or, you know, whatever, turning to BSD licenses and you know, no, finishing I'm, down the apple rabbit hole or whatever. That's what not. That's not what 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 I was about yeah, here. Right. It's it's more. Um, we have one model of, of working in in our free software e ecosystem. That um, maybe this model in some at some point in time is not relevant anymore. Mm -hmm. It's like. Um, you, um, maybe some of you know this um, um, Gunkart's model of, um, of evolving um, 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 system. There is a first system which is um, um, a big hack. The, the second system is built by a community and great and um, does everything. But at some point in time, this, this second system becomes irrelevant. Fundamental um, ideas will be changed, and a third system will uh, or third systems will evolve. On, um, will evolve on the. Um, 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 on the remains of the second system. Um, that's just what's happening now, slowly, with X, for example. Um, mm -hmm. X will not be completely disintegrate, di disintegrating, but um, people will evolve on it. And I think the same, we should, we should have um, some thoughts about the same ideas um, in, in Debian, and we should prepare um, um, what might happen if, um, if this case um, starts growing on us. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I definitely think you're thinking farther ahead than I am, and that's great. <laughs> Anybody else with a question? I'm not sure how we are on time here. Um, I think th this integrating is not really an interesting point. Uh, Debian is, I think, there to itch our scratch. If we don't have the scratch left, uh, there's no reason to itch as long as, as we are community driven, as long as there will be a scratch, we will continue to itch. Or the other way around, but yeah, yeah I, I take your point. <laughs> to uh, the um, mailing list problem, I mm -hmm. think um, I see a tendency on mailing lists that we have something like uh, this anti-politician and anti-intellectual uh, um, uh, um, point. Uh, it's too often uh, everything that's on a mailing list, that's bike shedding, if you give a point against something, then it, if it's not the opinion that you are, then it's bike shedding, it's not a technical argument, you are against progress, and um, I think we need to be a bit more collaborative uh, at this point to more listen to each other mm -hmm. and not to dismiss everything as everything you don't understand doesn't make sense. It's uh, only people that want their old stuff uh, uh, keeping there. It's, I think, um, the reason some flames 
go up very much is that it's important to people. And then it's important to listen to them and not just tell them, oh, old fart, uh, we don't care. I, I, think, it, um, I think if you go back and look at older uh, threads in Debian like I did for this talk, or if you go you know, wherever stuff's getting done and you look at what a thread looks like when stuff is getting done and people are busy making things happen versus when people are busy complaining about other people making things happen or whatever, there's a really different tone there and I think you can learn to recognize that tone and I don't know if you can teach people who are, caught, who are part of the problem, which we all probably are from time to time, to squelch that down or not, but I, I think it's something we need to be, rec yeah, Enrico. Oh, no mic. Okay. No, it's right there. There's a stand. Go up to the stand. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh. Uh, on that point, it's, it's interesting you make that point. Um, I found myself, uh, after some frustrating discussion I was having, asking people to please, a uh, real life discussion about something completely different, uh, asking people, to, uh, t telling people, please, uh, can you please uh, stick to, I'm more interested in hearing your personal story, I'm more interested in hearing your experience in what you have done, please don't, I'm less interested in hearing uh, what you wish would, would happen. I'm less interested in hearing what you wish I would do. Uh, please let me choose what I would do and I'm happy to hear your experience. Um, and I think that is a pattern that also matches very well what you mentioned. When people are getting things done, they're not discussing about the way they wish everybody else would believe, or uh, the way they wish everybody else would have done something, uh, but they, they bring in their experience. When I did this last time, I did it this way, uh, and it didn't work, let's try another way. Uh, but then, as it, uh, when it comes from personal experience, it is more about getting things done than about seeing who has the better ideas or something, which is rather pointless. Um, so yeah, I, I wish in mailing list to see people bringing in their experience, their stories at work, um, the way they fixed the problem like that before and, and how, rather than people should do this. People should do this is possibly something I don't want to see in a mailing list anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think we have to somehow learn to be more accepting of just doing something and if it's a mistake, reverting it, you know. We, it would be great if we had more technology around this, but just socially deciding, you know, if somebody wants to go off and do something, then let them. And if it turns out to be a bad idea, we can undo it later. And trying to, I think, you know, if you look at where we're really good in Debian, at making things happen. It is stuff like the one maintainer for package model where people are given the power to go off and do something and it, it's their responsibility and if you have a flame war about it, well we have processes but we don't use them very often. And it would be great if we could find more ways to expand that kind of, that way of doing things off into things that don't just touch one package. You know, I, I think that's kind of what's broken down is that we're, we're building this bigger stuff on top of individual packages and we don't really have a way to go off and say this guy is going to handle the system be transition with this group of people these got together or something maybe that doesn't work Beto looks unhappy with it so maybe it's a bad idea but you know there seems there must be a way to make it happen anybody else yeah yeah i i used to expect that at some point sooner or later debian would effectively just split into multiple groups which competed with each other. I mean, I know some people talk about Ubuntu as a fork of Debian, but it's kind of a different thing. I really thought that maybe sometime there'd just be a discussion where the two sides just disagreed so badly about some issue that you would end up with two things, basically both of which claimed to be the true Debian, mm. which obviously one probably would own the trademark, but yeah, I mean, both of them would just think they were the true continuation and hate each other forever. Okay. That seems to have become less likely now. Um, and it seems to me that most of the times we have big discussions, it just ends up with 
not much happening rather than something happening that really annoys people. I mean, in some ways that's better, in some ways that's worse. You know, that, that's a fascinating comment. I, maybe you've, I mean, that's a, that, that doesn't fit in any of my three models, <laughs> the forking off thing. And it is multiple <laughs> universes. Obviously, it fits in the cosmological model. And so, uh, yeah, that's fascinating. How, I mean, why is that less likely now than it used to be? Is there less excitement and energy around Debian, or is it something else? I, yeah, I mean, and now I would worry more that, again, if things get, it's get harder to push new ideas and you end up, it's not, well, we are still getting new people, but we're, if you look at the official members of Debian, we're basically only at a replacement yeah. rate. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I don't know, not, I had to say looking around the room, in particular here, but we're definitely a kind of aging population too. Yeah. <laughs> um, so although that's, that gets us still fine for a few decades, but um, yeah, if we want to continue in the kind of long term of Debian having a good future and still being relevant, then we, again, on your graph, we need yeah. to, how do we get back into, a, into really growing, not just growing around the community, around the edges, kind of helpers and contributors and so on, but actually that our, our, our people who are members of Debian should also be growing and taking new ideas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, sort of replying to that, uh, if we go a bit smaller than cosmology, uh, cosmological uh, and go to galactic, say. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think uh, Debian could be looked at as if it started out being a, uh, a star nursery and then uh, we had turned into a galaxy and we're now at a stage where we need to find a way of maintaining the black hole. <laughs> because otherwise, <laughs> if, if people aren't allowed to work on an alternative black hole, then the arms will fly off. As, uh, what? We need to suck more. <laughs> we need to suck more, yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> so, so the black hole is the sort of boring central packages which you're not allowed to touch because if you do that, everything will break. And we need a way of instantiating a new galaxy next door and just replacing the black hole. And as you say, if it doesn't work, you can get revert. Uh, so, uh, and the other thing is that if you look at the mailing lists, you get the impression that there's a war going on where there is going to be a schism and uh, th half the people will go off and maintain their servers and the other half will go off with their uh, tablets or whatever and sort them out. But actually the people in those discussions aren't going to build either of those things and the rest of Debian is just getting on with it. So that's why I think Debian doesn't fragment is because the vocal people aren't necessarily the people doing the job. Hmm. I, I think there's another possibility, and that is that um, when I think about Murray's question, there are, there are more derivatives of Debian than any other core distribution. So there are certainly lots of people out there who have decided that the thing they wanted to do differently or that they cared about was worth going and creating a, a CDD or a fork or whatever. So that's happened. It just hasn't dragged the trademark into or the name into some kind of a, a pit, which I would hate to see happen. But I have the sense that maybe the, the other thing about it is that Debian has become large enough and means enough things to enough people that you know the vast majority of us in the project who don't give a flying you know what about whether it's Upstart or System D, you know, that, that's an impassioned, important discussion for the people for whom how the system boots is the thing they care about in Debian. But for the vast majority of us, it's like, as you say, you know, I do that once per kernel update cycle, a reboot, and the rest of the time I just don't care. And so, <coughs> um, the the idea that you know the distribution would fracture or somehow Debian wouldn't be Debian anymore because there's a fractious discussion going on in a particular sub project or sub part of the distribution is just hard for me to wrap my brain around. Yeah, it kind of, it kind of seems like it'd have to be something that isn't technological based, some kind of, you know, we want to change the social contract or maybe we want to change what free software is and that would fracture Debian, but yeah. So on the lines of what Bedell just said, uh, this, this way that we are becoming almost a preferred choice to be upstream um, is, a, is a very good thing and um, that enables our work to scale much better than if we try to grow the project. I think the reason why we aren't growing in terms of number of people is because we're already at some kind of limits of scaling. We're having 
you know, a lot of the things we're talking about are difficulties to do with coordinating and communicating between this number of people. And allowing and becoming upstream for people is a way for us to scale that a lot better. And one of the things that we should be trying to do is to look outward rather than inward and to try to think of ways in which we can be a better upstream for people to make it easier for people to derive so that fewer people have to do their work within Debian and that they're easier to, to do it outside Debian. Because after all, software freedom is about freedom to make the change yourself to the software you're using. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you want to have a huge kind of get involved with a huge complicated upstream who have processes and decide to do things a particular way. No, you should just be able to do it. At the moment, if you actually want to do that, it's quite hard. Um, and we should make it easier. Yeah. Um, you know, w when you think about that, um, maybe, I mean, it's kind of what's happening now. But you have to wonder if, I mean, your scenario, you, it can go one of either two ways. You can have a lot of custom Debian distributions and things based on Debian, and Debian can just become a background infrastructure, and then who wants to work on it when it's something that's down there in the depths that other, th other exciting things are being built on top of? You know, maybe you contribute patches back when it makes your life easier, but do we get, you know, do we get a sustaining model that way? Or, you know, maybe we don't. Um, I kind of used to have this argument with Manoj. I thought that Debian had to expand or we were just gonna die. And Manish was like, no, Debian is just about what I need for my system and what my friends need for their systems. I don't need, you know, I'm only interested in it for that, in that way. And I don't know, maybe Manoj was right. Um, you know, I, I think that I was definitely wrong. Um, you were both right. Well, <laughs> yeah, the best <laughs> arguments are always that way, right? That's what universality is. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I guess time is over, so we have to take this as <laughs> the closing comment. And yeah, you have to move it to lunch to discuss over that. Okay, thanks everybody.